Behold, you are in the presence of Murdoch, who gracefully grants you a Music Minute audience. Yeah. We'll talk one more time about Queen today and their release Queen 2. Guess what? It was their second album. At that time, Queen were still a band struggling for critical recognition, an audience and a musical identity. The history of Queen begins with a student band called Smile, formed by Brian May while studying physics and infrared astronomy in London. Before achieving a breakthrough in the late 60s, the band, now also featuring Roger Taylor as drummer, lost its singer Tim Staffel over stylistic differences. In stepped a fan of the band, Freddie Bulzara from Zanzibar, Bulzara had been with a band called Wreckage and soon changed to his stage name Freddie Mercury. He also suggested to change the band name to Queen. After completing the lineup with bass player John Deacon, the band recorded its self titled debut in 1973 using off peak studio hours. Debates with their producers led to an unsatisfying end product for the band. Still, Queen received several favorable reviews, but gained little attention with the public. Eager to realize their musical visions more successfully than on the debut, Queen soon began recordings for their second album in 1973. Always interested in studio technology and using the full potential of the studio, Queen developed a complex, layered sound derived from genres like prog rock and hard rock. Especially Freddie Mercury's distinct vocals and stage antics, as well as Brian May's instantly recognizable guitar tone, should define Queen's identity from here on. The album Queen 2 was released in early 1974. And on this album, Queen tried to give themselves a darker fantasy image. I mean, it starts with the iconic cover shot of the band. You know this photo even if you've never heard the album. Uh, this image was famously reused for the Bohemian Rhapsody video and um, is probably one of the most famous photographs of the band. Then we've got the division into a side white and a side black, which in connection with songs about a white queen and a black queen certainly brings up images of chess or, well, some kind of fantasy saga. A lot of the songs segue into each other, which emphasizes that impression of a connected work or even a concept story behind all this, when actually there isn't a real storyline involved. Cheeky. Really cheeky. This impression of an allegedly underlying concept is also transported or introduced by the intro of the album, the very grave and indeed royal sounding procession uh, which seems to have been composed for a royal coronation or a royal burial. The song is only one and a half minutes long, consisting of layers and layers of Brian May's guitar, but in terms of atmosphere, this is an absolute highlight in uh, Queen's works. Procession seamlessly moves into the first proper song, Father to Son, written by Brian May, like the majority on site white. And with this one, Queen go straight ahead into rock epicness. Father to Son is a six and a half minute slow burner with an epic and catchy chorus, a heavier section in the middle, apparently acoustic guitar by John Deacon, and, of course, Brian May's wonderful guitar work. The song is about the special relationship between father and son and sort of 
words of wisdom given from father to son. Um, the lyrics and the feel of the song also open up the vague fantasy style uh, of the album that is about to go completely over the top in the second half of the album. Father to Son truly is an overlooked gem in the Queen catalogue. In order to keep up the impression of a thematic connectedness, Father to Son segues into another epic ballad, White Queen, as it began. This song dates back to the days of Smile and is dedicated to a young lady that Brian adored from afar. This is a very tender, slightly mystical track, including an acoustic guitar solo that almost sounds like a sitar, and heavier power chord crescendos that uh, even increase the epic qualities of this track. Yes, even early on, this band was really good at epic and bombastic sounds. The fourth song is called Someday, One Day, another Brian May original and this time almost entirely performed by him. He plays various guitar and also sings on this track. This is a lighter, more acoustic piece, very 1970s. I quite like it. If you are looking for a worthwhile deep cut by Queen, have a look at this one. And so we get to the last track on the first side, and that's The Loser in the End by Roger Taylor. I get that this is meant pretty tongue-in-cheek, but it doesn't do a lot for me. We get those uh, quite ironic lyrics dedicated to mothers around the world, set to that very overpowering almost a bit heavy-handed rock sound and Roger's raspy vocals, but it's, it's not much of a tune, to be honest. It's not a bad song per se, but for me it uh, disrupts the album's flow a bit. I think uh, the Roger Taylor songs got better on later Queen albums. Still, it's always fun to have a song by the drummer on an album. So let's move on to side two, side black of the album. This is entirely Freddie's show. All six songs were written by him, taking us on a ride through his fantasy kingdom of Rye. It starts right off with Ogre Battle. This is an absolutely hilarious track. It's funny as hell, but also one of the heaviest Queen songs you can find. For Ogre Battle, the band really utilized everything that was possible with their relatively low production budget. You get tons of overdubs. Um, the intro is the song played backwards. There are sound effects and the high-pitched um, choir vocals, operatic vocals that were to become Queen's trademark. The song is riffy and fast-paced, moving somewhere between prog rock and proto-metal, and all that just to describe a battle between ogres. Kudos to Freddy. For the next song, Freddy takes us to an art gallery. The Fairy Fellas Masterstroke is based on and inspired by the painting of the same name by Victorian artist Richard Dead. Dead had killed his dad 
and uh, spent most of his life in a criminal lunatic asylum where he also painted uh, that picture. Um, he had given each character in the painting a name and a background story and that clearly inspired Freddy's songwriting. The track is as busy as the painting on the canvas. Freddy plays a nervous harpsichord, there are a lot of operatic vocals and hyperactive stereo panning. Within two and a half minutes we get a sort of mini operetta and it is not the only time that the material on Queen 2 clearly foreshadows Bohemian Rhapsody and the A Night at the Opera album. The Fairy Fellas Masterstroke directly moves into Nevermore, thus again creating the impression of a somehow thematically connected suite of songs. Nevermore is a gorgeous evocative piano ballad about heartbreak. It's a very short piece, but a great song by Freddie. Nevermore serves as a kind of prelude to the opus magnum of the album, The March of the Black Queen. The title, of course, seems to create a sort of antipole to Side White and the song White Queen, when in fact there is no real connection or concept running through the album. The March of the Black Queen is stunning, heavy proc, Freddie shows his full vocal range here. There are complex passages, there are heavier parts and very operatic parts, and overall uh, this track can be seen as a darker, maybe even more complex, older sibling to Bohemian Rhapsody. Every Queen fan should listen to this one. And since this is a Queen album, there is a complete stylistic change with the next track. The March of the Black Queen segues into Funny How Love Is, the most straightforward pop song on the album. This one really sounds like a forgotten 1970s radio single, although it never was one, I believe. Um, inspired by Phil Spector's Wall of Sound production technique, the song sounds quite different uh, from all the other ones, uh, but yeah, this is a nice catchy ditty. And so we get to the final track, Queen's first successful single, The Seven Seas of Rye. A very short, fast track. It is characterized by a catchy, very distinct piano lick. Rye was um, a fantasy kingdom that Freddy and his sister had invented as children. And yeah, this is a fun rocker. In terms of songwriting, maybe not quite up there with uh, Queen's later hit singles, but I really like this one quite a lot. Uh, it's a favorite of mine on this album. Interestingly, a short instrumental version of this track had already been used as the closing track on Queen's debut album. Um, this uh, fully-fledged version with vocals uh, was released as a single and was the first top 10 hit for the band in the UK. Off-sailed Queen 
on the seven seas of Rye to an even bigger future, quoting the old music hall ditty I do like to be beside the seaside uh, in the last seconds of the album. Queen 2 is a bit megalomaniac, boisterous and pretentious, everything Queen wanted to be in order to gain the attention they thought they deserved. The whole play with the black and white theme uh, gives the album uh, a bigger symbolic meaning than it actually has got, but I think that really works um, in its favor and adds to the special and unique charm of Queen 2. Although some critics found the album too over-the-top and self-indulgent, Queen 2 has gained a cult fandom over the years, and I can absolutely see why. Um, as mentioned, I think this album has a unique um, and very charming atmosphere in the Queen catalogue. To me, it is one of their most cohesive and also one of their best albums in a kind of nerdy way. This album is absolutely worth discovering if you like a bit of over-the-top glam rock or a bit of sword and sorcery hard rock with operatic excursions. It is a very inventive album and an important step for Queen musically. Do listen to Queen 2 if you've never heard it. We are afraid the time is up. The audience is over and we have to withdraw to subject our royal ears to some more music. See you in the next video.